to the biodiversity data. What we have been able to do in last 10 years is to put together a global infrastructure for exchange and sharing of biodiversity data. Uh, we have over 400 publishers in uh, 67 different countries of the world, uh, and together they publish uh, uh, 14,000 data sets. Uh, it's a federated uh, network. Every data set is developed in their own uh, forms and formats, but then we've used uh, uh, data exchange standards, what we call predominantly a Darwin Core data exchange standard for sharing biodiversity data, and through which, uh, through the GBIF data portal, you get an access to over 327 million data records about the existence of plants and animals right from early 1800 till date. Uh, and that's all contributed by 14,000 plus data sets uh, coming from 400 plus data publishers. Obviously, you will see the dark patches in north, northern hemisphere. That's where predominantly data is being published. Uh, so there are biases in the data that is available. If one has to assess the state of biodiversity based on the data that is accessible, then the uh, center of mass of world's biodiversity would be in the Leicester Square in London, which is not a true picture. But then that's exactly how the science itself works, especially in the discipline that I work in. So what are the lessons learned with GBIF's existence in 10 years in federating these data and making it accessible? Thumbs up to technology and infrastructure. It's not a barrier. Uh, so when I speak to my colleagues uh, and then say, we don't have enough sufficient technology, we don't know about standards, and we don't have enough infrastructures, I would say that's an excuse. So technology and infrastructure is not a barrier as such. What's really challenging is to work on capacity building, changing people's habits, changing the policies, adopting them to the new environment, bringing in social change and cultural change. Very difficult to um, address to and very difficult to inculcate when you are used to doing the work that you are doing for decades together. And century old traditions, very difficult to uh, foresee and inculcate new changes in the world of data publishing. Before we go and before I start talking about how I see the next generation publishing, let's take a pause and look at the trends in scientific publishing. Mostly we publish through scholarly publishing, uh, journals such as Nature, Science, uh, and other scientific journals. We prefer also to publish the institutions mostly through gray literature, such as the scientific reports. If you really have innovation, then you take a route of patents. But very small fraction of community is really engaging and taking advantage of the digital world and thereby publishing the data uh, into the digital and cyber world. So that's how, by and large, the trend in my discipline of the sciences, and I believe that's very much true in many other disciplines of science and technology and social sciences as well. Why does then we prefer scholarly publishing over data publishing? So what are the impediments to data publishing? We lack a cohesive, comprehensive data publishing framework. A framework that can encompass everybody that can not only address technical infrastructural challenges, but also take on and address to majority satisfaction the social, cultural, uh, political challenges, policy related challenges and policy related questions. And most importantly, a framework that, that can satisfy an individual's ego and institutional pride at time. And what is that ego and pride? It's about visibility. Will my work be recognized if I choose 
to publish the data sets over writing a small correspondence in nature science or any other scholarly publications. And I think that is the question that needs to be addressed. So, the subset of that data publishing framework is lack of incentives. Do I have an incentive by way of investing my time, money, energy and valuable time that I have to do my research work in assembling and publishing the data? So, we started investigating this question in 2008. Uh, we constituted a task group called GBIF's Data Publishing Framework Task Group that was led by Tom Moritz, the then librarian at the American Natural History Museum, um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Krishnan, who happens to be a chemist at the India's National Chemical Laboratory. And the recommendations of that task group uh, were published last year in a special issue of BMC Bioinformatics. So, you would see somewhere around 22 to 27 recommendations. But then, what were the four major recommendations? It encouraged the biodiversity world to encompass and start using persistent identifiers, right at data set level, but also at data record level. It requested biodiversity world that sufficient metadata be published in the form of scholarly publication called data papers. It encourages biodiversity world to evolve, establish and implement the data citation practices that are some way replicate the printed citation practices, but also takes on advantages of the digital world. And then it also challenged the biodiversity world to institutionalize what I call as data usage index, whereby the impact of one's effort in publishing data could be assessed, measured, and therefore the investment in data management in the research cycle itself can be assessed, to, similar to what we are doing through an impact factor for scholarly publications. How we would like to then take on these challenges in our domain of biodiversity data management and publishing. JBIF's another task groups on uh, persistent identifiers looked at the potential of using persistent identifiers, not only for data, but we can use persistent identifiers for data records, the specimens the physical vouchers that are stored in the herbariums and museums of the world, and there are supposedly 6 billion of them in natural history museums and the herbariums spread across different regions of the world. So, the persistent identifiers could be assigned to these vouchers themselves. Large number of, uh, because of the advent in the biotechnology area, lot of uh, uh, identification is happening through genome sequencing and the barcoding. So, the sequences themselves could be assigned with the persistent identifiers. The taxonomic names for the organisms, uh, these taxon concepts and names and their authoritative taxonomies could be assigned with persistent identifiers. And then to tie up to all of that, the scholarly publications to assign DOIs to themselves, but then also to the legacy literature and the multimedia artwork that explains the biological concepts, the anatomical features and morphological features of the living world could also be tied with the persistent identifiers and obviously the other objects and people who work in the area of biodiversity, science as such. So, there is a vast potential and that is a recommendation and uh, as uh, Jan was saying that we have been, uh, we have started to deal with two of those issues right now. One, what kind of persistent identifiers can be assigned to data sets and data records? And second, which would be the best way to link the persistent identifiers for, from physical voucher specimens 
to the data records themselves. Uh, in fact, uh, the Natural History Museum London has arrived at conclusion that they would start assigning DOIs to all each of their 70 million specimen records that are housed in the Natural History Museum. So uh, those are the challenging issues and I think it opens up vast potential for a community like data site to think beyond assigning DOIs to data sets. How can we assign those DOIs to data records and the voucher specimens and interlink them? How do we make sure that the paratypes, syntypes, lactotypes, and the type specimens are distinguishable from the duplicates? How do we make sure that the sequence that has been generated from a particular voucher specimen be linked with the data record, the scholarly, publish, uh, scholarly article, and the voucher specimen itself. So there are immense challenges that I think probably this community could use biodiversity informatics world as one of the uh, pilot area to think of these linking challenges. But then one of our major problem is that everybody would like to publish the data. But they don't publish data because everybody feels it's too much of a burden to write good metadata. In fact, my own experience of two decades in working in biodiversity informatics tells me that my colleagues are very happy to throw away their data and say, take the data, publish it, don't come and ask me to write metadata about it. Because it's easy to publish data, difficult to write good metadata a metadata that can demonstrate the quality of the data sets, history of how data sets has been managed, and probably will help me assess what are the potential uses of that data set that I can make use of. And so one of the way that we thought to encourage community to write metadata is to publish it as a scholarly article. So data paper is a scholarly publication of a searchable metadata document that describes a data set or group of data sets. What would it bring in? Promote and publicize the existence of data through the printed literature or scholarly literature. It brings credit to all those who are involved in data publishing and data management. And it describes the data in a structured, human readable form uh, uh, as well. But most importantly, the biggest thing that is happening in our world because of the data paper, there is a peer review of data sets. So data sets are undergoing extensive quality control checks. Uh, we have something like uh, first uh, six data papers published through six journals. Uh, we have about 50 of them in pipeline at the moment. So by end of uh, this year or by first quarter of next year, we would have about 70 data papers published in about six different journals. And then the community of aquatic biodiversity journals, about 27 of them have started to work with a EU funded project called Biofresh in exploring to make data paper as one of the section in their uh, journal as well. So there is an immense interest, and this is what is exciting to a scientist. He is now ready to take out six, seven, ten hours for writing good metadata, because now he is going to get one publication, even if it is in a low impact factor journal. And I think uh, this is something that we believe uh, is possible. What we have done is that GBIF has a uh, publishing toolkit called Int Integrated Publishing Toolkit. When you publish data through GBIF's IPT, uh, it uh, asks you to write metadata. Once you write metadata, you have an auto conversion uh, key which generates your meta, transforms your metadata into a manuscript. The manuscript is submitted to the journal. It goes through peer review process of journal, and once accepted, then it's published uh, as a, a, a scholarly publication. And the DOI of that publication is linked with the persistent identifier of a data set. 
So it is very much possible. Initially when we started the data papers were just manuscript, uh, text manuscript without any kind of qualitative and quantitative analysis of the data. Uh, currently two journals which are leading this is Zookeys and Phytokeys uh, who are publishing uh, obviously the faunal and the floral data sets. But increasingly now the authors of this metadata are doing qualitative and quantitative analysis and that itself is included as the data paper of the component of the data paper. So it is possible to have statistical analysis, content assessment and visual presentations of your data through the data paper. Uh, so data paper in words of Libomir Pene who is the first of our editor who has come forward and said you can publish data papers in six of my journal is an evolutionary step in ensuring discovery and access of biodiversity data resources over the internet. It will place the publication of biodiversity data on par with scholarly publishing. And this is exactly the question that I was always troubled in last two decades because I was always involved in data publishing and those of my colleagues who works with the sequences or works with the taxonomy, anatomy, physiology and publish into high impact factor journals will look down at my work. Here is an instrument that I could also say my work of data publishing do have impact factor now. And I think that satisfies ego but at the same time encourages many of the neglected data managers community and data publishers community. Second challenge is that of data citation. Currently given the matrix that we have it is difficult or impossible given the existing citation metric systems to identify who originally collected, created or added value to the data record or the datum itself. That is what my friend Dave Roberts says. Uh, and this is a reality. When you come to GBIF's portal, search the data, this is what the kind of citation that you get. A funny string of URI which has no head and clue who is the owner of the data, who is the publisher of the data, who collected it, when it collected, how it has been published, what kind of quality control it has gone through and so and so forth. So we need the elements in our citation string that identifies publisher, that can give, uh, that can identify the data sets uh, uniquely, give credits to the each and every contributor and the role of that contributor. Because the way biodiversity science works is somebody goes to the field, collects the data, someone then enters the data into computer, the other person identifies which organism that is somebody else will do it then georeferencing and then it goes to the data managers community who would massage that data rightly or wrongly and will publish it. So there are several at least about 20 people involved from data collection to data publishing and I think all have chipped in their efforts so all needs to be recognized and acknowledged. Uh, how about the releases and updates? Uh, data volume and as well as how which is the best way of accessing data. So therefore to address that challenge we come up with, came up with the recommended practice for citation of the data that is published through our network. It proposes two types of citation. The citation that is announced by the publisher of the data saying that please cite my data set as and the particular string. But when you access the data through a federated network like GBIP for a particular search string you will get part of data from several data sets. So therefore on top of the publisher based citations there will be query based citations and below the query based citation string will be the cascading publisher citations embedded into one. So if I just have to elaborate how it will 
happened and is beginning to happen now, just take the top one uh, for a first data sets that's ending with 599. The citation according to uh, once the new uh, practices are adopted and implemented will provide me information about the publisher of the data set, when the data set was first published, who contributed to the data set development and what role they played, where I can access the data sets, when it was released, when it was last updated and this entire citation string is then mapped to the digital object identifier. So in a journal like nature and science where every word and space for every word counts, I can only give the DOI of a data set as a uh, short citation and then when I resolve that DOI, the full length citation will be resolved. The another aspect is that I do not have enough encouragement today to invest time and energy. The directors of the research institutions do not have enough encouragement to invest in data management because this is not counted when the uh, investment vis-a-vis -vis outcome of an institution is assessed. So therefore, we need a mechanism by way of which we can assess the impact of one's investment and effort in data management and data publishing. Therefore, in 2009, we came up with the idea of what we call as data usage index. It is similar to the impact factor for scholarly publishing, uh, where a professional recognition mechanism that can also assess the impact of data publishing. And I think that is urgently required. If data management has to be an integral part of the scientific management and scientific uh, management chain. Unless and until this does not happen, data publishing will always remain a secondary activity. It will never get a primary focus and therefore millions and trillions dollars and euros worth of public investment in the science that we do will remain invisible and will always go down the drain. Uh, so the data usage index as it has been conceived is a measure of impact of data publishing by being accessed and used by the stakeholder community. Who is using this data? For what purposes? How they are using it? It helps in identifying those patterns. At least we envisage that it will help. It is very much at the moment in a prototype phase. Uh, but then it it based it is computed on uh, 14 different uh, parameters and indices. Uh, it will help assess the impact of publisher, uh, the data sets, uh, impact in given thematic area uh, because in a biodiversity world, uh, one thematic area such as or ornithology or mammals there are large number of people working in that area. But on um, marine biology, there are very few number of people, especially on benthic organisms, furthermore few number of people working on that area. So the impact and scale of impact will change from thematic area to thematic area. And we hope that this will at some stage cumulatively will also help assess the country's investment in data management and data publishing. Uh, this is explained in the first paper that, uh, the second paper that uh, Peter and I wrote in a special issue of uh, BMC Bioinformatics. Uh, cumulatively of all of this, implementation of DO, uh, DOIs or persistent identifiers, data papers, data citations and data usage index. I think essentially the funding agency themselves will able to make informed decision which projects to invest. They will also able to demand that before you apply for your next uh, funding, have you published the data. There are all sorts of policies currently available, but we lack mechanism and instrument to implement those policies. And we believe that implementations of these recommendations will help 
evolve those mechanisms, whereby you will be able to implement the policies. But then for an individual scientist or a researcher or a naturalist, it will give me recognitions in terms of impact factor through the research paper that I publish and the data usage index for data publishing. But then I want to dream into future. Is it enough to stop with impact factor and data usage index? It's enough to stop with this. I think we need to consciously work and move forward whereby we can come up with what I call as unified publishing index. And let me share my initial thoughts on what I mean by an unified publishing index. It's an index which is combination of your current impact factor, various indices to assess the citation impact, data usage index or something similar that can assess the impact of data publishing and any other indices. And together that would form a unified publishing index which will comprehensively and cohesively assess the investment and effort in collecting data, right from collection of data to analysis to interpretation through call and uh, dissemination of knowledge and wisdom through scholarly publications and another forms of dissemination of knowledge. And I think they, this in my opinion will help us comprehensively assess the people's investment in the R&D uh, or the social sciences work that we do. Unless and until we don't move forward in this direction, I think we as a community can continue to fool around with the taxpayers and investors uh, investment into the research that they have mandated us to do. Uh, many would say that's impossible. I do believe it's impossible too. It's like fighting with a Japanese sumo wrestler. Who's going to do it? Do we have infrastructure? Do we have agreed protocols and standards to do all of this? What will happen to Thomson Reuters if we have to cumulatively assess the impact? Would they like to make an business propositions and benefits out of it? I have no answer, but I think collectively, we can look at the answers because I strongly believe impossible is nothing. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And before I um, take on questions, uh, let me do a customary task as Anne has asked me, is to introduce you to a international task group called International Co-Data Task Group on Data Citation Standards and Practices which is meeting from this afternoon till Saturday evening here in Copenhagen at the Zoological Museum and trying to work on the uh, developing data citation practices. So essentially the task group will work on its report that we hope will be available to the community by end of this year or early next quarter. It's being chaired by Jan himself together with Sarah and Bonnie and has a member from different regions of the world and institutions. Uh, its objectives is to look into existing literature and initiatives, look into the practices of data repositories, how they are citing the data, uh, but essentially to create awareness uh, about the urgency of best practices for data citations and evolve standards and practices for data citations and promote the scientific data attributions. Uh, we had a meeting in last August in Berkeley where we made a significant progress and we hope to have that report published anytime soon now. Uh, we will have meeting at CoData conference in Taipei, uh, but then we, we are working to develop the white paper by end of this year and the best practice white paper uh, sometime in the first or the second quarter of 2013. And if you have any specific questions, address them to Sarah, Paul, uh, or Cohen. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>